The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. Good uh, yawning this morning, and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM on this Tuesday, the 3rd of August, 2021. Let me start the show off by saying I hope everybody had a wonderful and happy Emancipation Day and Emancipation Day holiday. And look at that. You had one day to be free, and then the next day you had to be free from being free. Oh, holiday for holiday. I love it. I love it. But more importantly, Emancipation Day is an important moment for all of us on this side of the hemisphere, whether you are part of the African diaspora or not. Emancipation Day is a moment to be honored and recognized. And this week and next week, we will be having several discussions to touch on that. But today... I have guests from uh, social services to speak about the most recent industrial or protest action from social services, and I'm going to bring them into the show in a minute. I just want to say good yawning this morning and welcome back from the long holiday. Also, I need to put a little cheer in my voice because we get closer and closer to the end of mango season. And as we had that wonderful rain last night, when I say wonderful, I also take into mind that there are still people who have not been able to repair their homes, right, to prevent the rain from falling in. And so we, we, we acknowledge the situation of many in the country, but the rain was good for the trees. And I know those avocados are loving it. So watch your avocado tree, because they hang in with plenty water. And the hog plums are loving it. Watch your hog plum tree. And if you got a sour sob tree that is, bare, is nice and healthy and is bare when it gets wet, Watch your sour sop tree, because that's the type of rain that puts sour sop on your tree. I have two brief messages for you today from our show's sponsor. Remember, today's show is brought to you by the Department of Inland Revenue. The Employment Incentive Program. Did you know that VAT, registered businesses who are tax compliant, are eligible to participate in the government's Employment Incentive Program? and can receive up to $400 per week in tax credit for up to 10 new full-time employees. Visit atlas.revenue.gov.bs to apply. The offer is valid from July to December the 31st, 2021. This message is brought to you by the Department of Inland Revenue. I also want to send a shout out to two hardworking men I know, Chris and Romeo, my San Salvador cousins. Now, we ain't real cousins, right? But we family island cousins. I want to say good morning. These are two hardworking Bahamian men, the type of Bahamian men that don't rest easy, don't sleep well until they put in a hard day of work, until they sweat like man. I want you all to know, and I want the government to know and to understand this, that there are plenty of men out there like that. There's plenty of hard-waking Bahamian men who want to work, right? And they are relying on the powers that be to create an environment, right? Not to find them jobs and give them jobs, but to create an environment where work is more viable and likely. But don't forget that. Don't forget that. These hard-waking Bahamian people and men are out here waiting for the next move. Also, I want to say good morning to whoever blocked off Dorchester Street again. That's the street next to Flowers, headquarters on Bay Street. Now, last week I stopped and saw it blocked, you know. Parked the car, got out the car to take a picture. And then I noticed somebody in a uh, Bahama waist vest near the bin in the middle of the road. 
So I say, ease off, Aaron. I didn't even take the picture. I say, ease off. The people then work in. I see that the road is still blocked off without proper notice, indication, or signage. In fact, when I passed it this morning, there was a vehicle that had entered that road from the southern entrance to discover that the road was blocked off. And then they had to reverse, as Bahamians say, reverse back. They had to reverse into the road, right? This is a safety hazard. But worse than that, this is a simple fix, people. This is a simple fix. There are procedures and protocols already in place for road closures. All you have to do is follow the protocols. You don't even have to devise them or make them up. Just find them and follow them. I want to say good morning to the officers who were on patrol on Bay Street this morning, talking to people who had inadvertently parked their cars on sidewalks. Thank you for clearing the way for pedestrians, especially on this Emancipation Day. Well, day after Emancipation Day. I still free. I still feel free, even though I had to come to work. But thank you, officers. People rely on you doing your job for their survival especially since that zone is still a construction zone. Pedestrians should not be forced to walk in the road to make their way. I have a text here. It says, Erin, here is a future show topic. Is Grand Bahama the garbage dump of the hemisphere when I, it comes to ships? Are countries rejecting, rejected that all countries rejected that burning hazardous ship a few years ago, but Grand Bahama accepted it. Now there is some ship with wood-eating Asian beetles that Grand Bahama accepted. We are a mess. That can kill our agriculture. You're absolutely right, text, if you look in today's paper. I think both papers. Uh, certainly the Tribune has it on the headline. Don't blame us for beetle cargo fiasco. I don't have the time to get into that story today. I wish I did though, right? Because it's a sort of a great segue to the discussion with my guests. When you read that headline that says, don't blame us for beetle cargo fiasco. Well, who are we supposed to blame? I gotta do some more research on it, right? But from my heard, I, from my saw the word subcontractor, I wanna ask the contractor, who are we supposed to blame? That's your subcontractor, that's your boy. I mean, when I say that technically, that's your legal business partner, right? Who are we supposed to blame? Anyway, we'll get to that discussion. A little later in the week, I would like, well, I'm going to reach out to a couple of my environmentalist friends so we could get on it. I'm telling you guys, this is a big thing. When I talked last week about uh, the World Day Against Trafficking in Persons, this issue is as big as trafficking in persons, right? We allow, if we allow inadvertently or intentionally any agent that could destroy our natural resources could destroy our agriculture, could destroy our aquaculture, is a serious threat to national security. I mean, a serious threat. I see I've got a call on the line. we get to this call quickly, and then we're going to move on to our discussion with uh, social services protesters in the recent industrial action around a number of issues, including a delay in promotional exercises and a urgent matter with work program participants. Caller, you're on the clock. Hey, morning, Eric. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? I am blessed, man. I, you made it back through the holiday, and I, I hope that everybody else wake up in the land of the living and had something hot to eat this morning. Aaron, mm -hmm. I want to ask, I want to say something to you, and I, I want to say something to everyone who has a voice and who, who has an understanding. And I don't mean to change the paradigm shift in your, in your, in your topic. Well, but you, you Aaron, got one minute. One minute, just one minute. But mm -hmm. Aaron, listen to me. This, this, this you know, political politics thing, they call it the wacky season, but Aaron, some people going overboard, Aaron. All right? Aaron, I... I Support a, a government. I un, you, people know that. I don't have no shame in that. You but Aaron, I am not going to go overboard on social media, Aaron, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and defame someone's character. People, you know, what's the level of, of respect 
All right, why can't we have a fair election? Who win, who win? Who lose, who lose? I don't see why you have to go and consistently defame someone's character to, to look for likes or look for thumbs up. That don't make no sense. Aaron, at the end of the day, my sister, and I can leave this with you. Mm-hmm. We all have to live in the same place, whether the PLP win the government, whether the FNM wins the government. We all are Bahamians, my sister. Mm-hmm. We all have to live in the same place. I might have to come to Aaron one of these days for help, but how could Aaron help me if I talk about about Aaron? Yeah. Have a good one, my sister. Absolutely. But, and I tell you what, the point is, Aaron's supposed to help you, even if, even if you're talking bad about Erin, especially if that's Erin's legal duty, right? Like if she have a legal duty of care to you, if she have an ethical duty of care to you, right? And so the question is, how Erin supposed to feel doing her duty, knowing that the same people that she's helping are talking to her ba- about her bad and disparaging her character? Really, that's what it is. But always remember, even when people talk to you bad, if you have a duty of care, whether it's legal or ethical, and I want to throw moral in there. I, but that's just me. I throw in moral in there. If you have a duty of care, you got to do what you ought to do when you know you ought to do it. Even if the people talking about you bad. Even if the people hating your feelings. Even if the people cussing at you. And I want to say that I know this because the conversation we're about to segue into deals with a vital force in our country who continue to show up to work every day, despite the treatment and the engagement that they have with the general public. Because they understand the nature of their jobs. They understand that people come to them when they are hurt, when they are hurting, when they are in crisis. They know that when people come to them, the state that they are in probably renders them unable to find their best self, their most polite self. Right? But the job of the social services worker, the social worker, social services staff, is to understand that people come to them on their worst day. And that, the, that they, as workers, have to give them their best self in the face of the frustration, the anger, the rage, the despair. And so this show today is important to me I know we've talked about it, it's been in the paper, but this is one of those issues that we need to make sure that we are having a coherent, that means clear and sustainable conversation. That means we're going to keep on with the conversation until we come to a resolution. See, this conversation is important to me because my mother is a social worker. And as a child of a social, social worker, I had to reconcile with the knowledge, the understanding that my mother has a duty of care to people and children that don't have anyone else to care for them. That my mother has a duty of care and an obligation that before she go to bed at night, that she make sure the people under her care can go to bed at night, right? So I understand this. And just quickly, I can give you all a brief memory. When I was a little children, my mother came to pick us up one night from my housekeeper's house. And it was late. And everybody was tired and and rushing to get the children home to bed so they could go to school in the morning. And somehow my hand gets slammed in the car door in the chaos of the moment. Right? So that, that memory always stick with me. So I know what it means to have a duty of care for others, particularly the vulnerable, and what it means to understand that sometimes you can't be a priority even in your own mother's lives. And after listening to the statements made by members of staff, by the union representatives, right? I think it's imperative, it's important that we continue this conversation and make sure that these issues are heard by everyone. We cannot allow the people who take care of us to be left by the wayside. And we can't allow the people who we're going to rely on
to take care of ours, to take care of our dependents when we are unable to, whether due to death or injury. We got to have a different attitude about the people that work in this country, that keep it running, the labor movement, those that take care of the most vulnerable of us. On that note, let me introduce my guests, Ms. Shalita Colley, who will introduce herself, and Mr. Ferguson Kingsley. Kingsley, who will also introduce themselves. Now, to my audience, I will open up the phone lines. When I have civil servants on the show, I ask my guests who want to call in or text in and ask questions to be very measured and understand that civil servants have rules that they have to follow right, in the terms of how they can communicate about the issues they're speaking about. But I may let Ms. Cauley explain that as well. I think it's an important note. So good morning to Mr. Ferguson and to Ms. Cauley. How are you? Good morning, and thank you for having us. <laughs> My name is Shalita Cauley. I'm a senior clerk at the Department of Social Services, and I am a member of the Bahamas Public Services Union, and I like to say I'm a member for 21 years. I always tell people the first deduction that came out of my salary was for a union, and it has been a consistent relationship up to this time. When you spoke about public officers and as we come on the radio, for example, this morning I'm here speaking about our discussion and our protests that occurred last week. I'm here to discuss union matters, labor matters as it pertains to the staff of social services, right. but I am not here to discuss matters as it relates to social services because there are rules and regulations that say how we can speak and I have not had the permission of my senior staff or my director to do so, and I'll be a breach of protocol. Absolutely. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Bahamas, and thank you for having us. My name is Kim Sidi Ferguson, president of Bahamas Public Services Union and a bargaining agent for public servants. But for this morning, we are here to have a discussion regarding what transpired at the Department of Social Services. Absolutely. And so, after reading the press statements, right, and the list of issues that were covered, I would say that the Unemployment Work Assistance Program is the top issue in the list of things uh, being considered in the protest. But tell me, what are the priority issues in this particular protest? Well, Aaron, you are indeed correct. The thing, the, the, the Work Assistance Programmers is indeed a major concern because it, to a great extent, has the lives of those individuals at a stop. Um, there are so many things that happen for general public servants that don't happen for these people. And in my view, as far as I'm concerned, they're actually carrying the load that every other individual who know what the nature of their jobs are, are carrying. Uh, a number of these individuals are carrying full caseloads. A number of these individuals are doing the work of a welfare officer. And, and, and although the um, circumstances under which they were engaged was designed to be temporary to some extent, it still does not give an employer, so to speak, the right to exploit individuals for such an extended period of time. And can you give me a sense of what the salary looks like for that uh, what's supposed to be a temporary worker? Okay, the temporary persons on the unemployment work assistance program, they are paid two twenty a week. They don't get increment. They only are paid whatever the government's minimum wage is yeah. for the entire time. Some persons have been on the program so long, they said they started when they were paid $83. When the salary moved from 83, I think they went to $169.05. And I think it continued to move until we had an increase up to the 220. But these persons do not receive increments. They do not receive the same benefits that someone like myself, who's a full public officer, would receive. But we work in the same jobs, doing mm -hmm. the same work. For example, I am a clerical officer in the typing pool where I work. There are temporary workers sitting right next to me. All of us are doing clerical work but they don't have the same benefits or protection that I have as a public officer. Right. Now, is it possible that you said there are people who have been on the program since the minimum wage was $83, and they don't get increments. 
those people though, their salary has been uh, increased to the minimum wage. Not, no, not, they, so they're making eighty three dollars. Not, so, not well. Persons who from eighty three dollars, I guess, would have already um, come to what minimum wage is, is yes. supposed to be. Yes. Yes. But I got the understanding the other day that there's somebody still being paid one hundred sixty three dollars, and and that was a concern for me because then it means the government is in breach of their own laws. But not only do they not receive increment, when general salary increases take place, these individuals, they don't receive an increase. Their salary remains the same. The cost of living escalates. Their salary remains the same. So it places them in a very precarious position where they have to determine whether or not we're going to pay rent this week or we're going to eat on Sunday. Yeah. Well, um, Ms. Mm. Ms. Green, may I add Yeah, yeah, go on. My concern about this work program situation is this. The but do me a favor. Uh, just pull the mic closer to you. Yeah, speak right into the mic. Okay. The government is supposed to set the pace. Yeah. If the government is seen to be making um, arrangements in terms of employment where they pay people um, separate and equal, because I would describe the situation at social services as segregation. They have public officers and they have those on the work program. Doing the same work but on two separate situations. The public service is supposed to be equitable. We're supposed to be setting the pace. Social services is supposed to be the government's humanitarian end. How can they receive, be seen to be giving um, workers less than equitable treatment, particularly in the majority of these workers are poor, black, and female. They're already vulnerable in those classes. If we're going to be doing things that I said are fair, if social services first are going to say they're clients, then we have certain ethical responsibility, like you said, duty of care. We have legal responsibilities, and the government cannot begin to say we're going to pay people separate and equal, unequal, and then expect the, the private sector to be different. We have to set the pace, and we have to make sure that people are treated in an equitable manner, where they can live in a dignified manner. Well, listen, I, I, first thing I'd say is, how could the, the government, how could the public service union not be honoring its own laws, minimum wage, right? But then... The security officers, and we could get into a whole lot of other conversation about oh, how that 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 that, that, right? that opens a can of worm there. Yeah, right, yeah. so it's it it's not I, this behavior is not necessarily isolated to social services in this particular matter. We see this pattern. I, yes, because I have noticed across the public service, um, we are supposed to be um, public officers, but if we walk in the agency, a government agency, lately. There's a real chance the majority of persons, or a great number of the persons you see, are not public officers. They are either temporary, some way casual, contracted. so contracted. So what the government is doing is creating its own pockets of employment. And it's adversely affecting the employee as well as the public. Right, and the people who are, who are coming for services. So I listened to uh, Nahaja Black, they hit back with Nahaja Black on Friday. And one of the things that you would have mentioned um, Mr. Ferguson, is that in, there were, in 2016, there was a circular release from uh, the ap appropriate authority, Yes. if I'm using the correct language, empowering ministries to regularize Indeed. staff with financial allocations for that purpose attached or indicated Indeed. that they are attached. Indeed. From 2016, From right? 2016. And here we are, 2021. So yes. let's minus tw 2019 and 2020, right? That, this... That's FNM math. Yes. That's, a di that's different from PLP math. We go minus COVID and Dorian. That's three years, right? Plus with no action. That's plenty of years with no action. Indeed. I, I want to ask this question. You don't have to answer it. Do you think the, there's been an intentional stall in regularizing these people for the purpose of protecting the budget, like? I don't want to move money from programming and services to wages, right? Because I ain't going to ask the government for no more, or the government isn't going to give us any more money. So we don't want to take the money from programming and services and put it into wages. I, I don't think there was a money issue in that regard. When the circular was um, issued, it not only empowered the human resource personnel to regularize the individuals, but there was allocations to address 
the regularization yeah. exercise. And so um, there was really no excuse from anybody as to why the exercise wasn't continuous in the various ministries and departments. What was disappointing to me was to discover when we had a meeting with the permanent secretary at social services to find out that her human resource department did nothing at all after being empowered. And what I did before I commented, I gave them a copy of the circular and I asked if they was aware of this and they answered in the affirmative. Mm -hmm. um, then I asked, was there an update regarding those persons who would have been regularized? And I got a negative response. Nothing was done. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Go on, because I sit near stunned, I can be honest. I, I think what happens a lot of times with government, they say things, and sometimes they, I don't know if they do proper research and think clearly. And I just say this from a little worker perspective, because I think a lot of times they underestimate how vast the situation with temporary workers are with government. For example, social services, almost half of our staff is temporary. A major government entity like that who is supposed to be caring for people who are vulnerable. Our staff are in worse financial conditions than the people that we serve. And when you look at big departments like education, environmental health, when you look at school boards, local government, they carry a heavy component of temporary workers. Wow. And I think they, they need to take a lot of that. Um, I don't know how many of them are not regularized yet because they're supposed to be starting the process, but social services, um, if our um, HR department was on the ball, each year they ask us, even people like me who are waiting in the wings for never worry to never worry for promotion, yeah. they should have been able to say who is going to be promoted, how much persons are up for promotion. If we have a staff of 50%, for example, a temporary we're going to begin the process. Say how much you're going to be regulating. How are you going to do it? Don't just throw it in the air and never come back to it. Right. Now, this is the Department of Social Services. Yes, the Department. We have approximately 50%. Yes, ma'am. Is temporary, uh, temporary workers. Yes, ma'am. So, look here. Let's, uh, let's go to this call. Then we're going to go to a break. And when we come back from the break, I want to ask you about the career path for social workers. That's important. Yes, right? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, caller, you are on the clock. One second, caller. You are on the clock. I'm sorry, caller. I'm very sorry about that. Arlington, let's roll into this break. And when we come back from the break, we're going to find out what is this career path, right? Because I'm on a career path to Chichani Ketchen. And to be honest, I ain't going nowhere dead fast. But because maybe... The career path is the problem in getting people from temporary workers to regularization. We will be back in a second. Stay tuned to Guardian 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. I've been representing all my life. I'm getting ready to make it count this time. Since 2021 for your family line, you better get ready, it's about that time. So tell mama to be ready, tell it to the whole family, go out the top for two, the count depends on you. So tell to the go tell the law, lock it down on your calendar. Since it's 2021, this one's for everyone. Like what you're hearing on the show? Want to support the conversation? Sponsor on the clock today. Call Janet Lees at 302-2304. That's 302-2304. Be the solution. Sponsor on the clock of Aaron Green, where she dissects, we discuss, and you decide. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. <laughs> Good morning and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. You are on the clock with Erin Green. And we've got a full show this morning. I have another brief message for you from the Ministry of Finance about the Bahamas National Statistical Institute. 
Did you know the Department of Statistics has transitioned to the Bahamas National Statistical Institute effective July 1st, 2021? The BNSI is responsible for protecting the credibility, integrity, and impartiality of official statistics. For more information, visit www.stats.gov.bs. That's www.stats.gov.bs. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Finance. Good morning and welcome back to my guests in this conversation. So I wanted to talk about the career path for social workers because I figured, right, like maybe the government is saying, well, these people need more certification, they need more degrees, they need more paper, more letters behind their names before we could make this official movement from temporary to staff. But the career path for social workers is slightly different. Um, but let's stick on this uh, temporary workers program for a second, right? Um, I, I'm sure you not finished telling me everything. You have to tell me about it. But I am certain that I heard you say that some people have retired as temporary workers. Yes. Right? They've been in the program for 30 plus years or 30 years, 20 years, and yes. have retired. Yes. What does that mean for them if the government does actually engage the regular regularization exercise. Will those people get any um, funds? Will they be paid anything for the time that they worked? Well, let, let me answer it this way, Aaron. Um, when I would have had a discussion with the Minister of the Public Service, the Honorable Mr. Brentzel Roll, and I would have spoken to him about regularizing the individuals who were age 60. Uh-huh. He indicated that it would be unlikely that these individuals would be regularized because they won't have sufficient years in order to get a pension. And I emphatically stated to him, well, Minister, it is necessary for you to consider making their regularization retroactive to ensure that they're able to receive something because these individuals would have served for a number of years and it is not their fault that you would have chosen to seek to regularize them at age 60. And so our rationale was make it retroactive to ensure that these people are covered. So if he's saying that that individual who has already retired um, isn't going to receive any, well, the person that's 60 yeah. is not going to receive anything, well, you can imagine the state of the individual that's already retired. Absolutely. Wow. And so, um, again... If it's not exploitation, I need to get an understanding of what it is. And in my view, I think that the government has really, really been having a blatant disregard for not only the workers of this country, but the various agencies are supposed to deal with labor matter, matters, as well as the international agency which is the International Labor Organization that has conventions that deals with the exploitation and the dignity uh, and, 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 and the, 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 how do I want to put it here? The manner in which an employee should be feeling in relation to their employment. They should not be feeling that they're beneath everybody. There should be equity in this particular regard. Absolutely, especially if they are doing the work and making uh, the contributions. Um, excuse me, Ms. I yeah, wanted to absolutely. point out something. There was an article that appeared in the Tribune when a few years ago, social services was audited. Yes. And the Auditor General, Mr. Terence Bastiat, he used strong language. He said, egregious. Yeah. He said it was egregious. He said, because keeping them this long, they've already made them a part of the public service. The public service is already benefiting from their labor. Then the public service then has a duty to also, um, he said, to restore to them their lost increments because all the persons who are employed in the public service are paid increment. Mm -hmm. The problem with government is now that they say they're going to begin the regularization exercise, I think what they did not realize is because you had them employed for 30 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, if they had no increment, if you said you're correcting a wrong, yeah. 
you should go back and do what is right. From the point of the wrong. From the point of the wrong. From the point of the injury. Now, you can't take away the pain, but you can make restitution for what they did not receive. You cannot say now, we can't. Um, we can't make you a regular permanent employee because it is too expensive. Then you're saying it was all right for government to exploit me. I think what happened, social services started this on the right path. They wanted to say help persons who were um, needing assistance, but then it ballooned into an employment program. And because they saw a large supply of cheap labor, which they could get workers in without going through the normal government process, put them in regular sanctioned government workers position, then they say, put them there, put them there, but don't give them any benefits. Now that the chicken have come home to roost, now that it's been built up so long and it's impacted so many people, the government say, but we can't do anything. They've been here too long and it's too expensive. That's the same argument the slave masters use to um, legitimize slavery. They need a large supply of cheap labor for the plantations. Mm -hmm. but, but remember too now, um a number of these individuals, when they complained, they were given the excuse that you're not qualified. So a number of them went out and they qualified themselves. And so you would find that among these work programmers, you actually have people that have various degrees, associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees. They've upgraded yeah. themselves so that they can actually hold substantive positions. And in spite of all of this, there's been a delay in relation to one, regularizing them, because in my view, not only should some of these people be regularized, but some of these people should be regularized slash promoted all at the same time. Absolutely. Keep going. Because even in, in reference to what you spoke, speaking about the career path for the social workers, I think people just think in the department would be just hand out coupons. But pound for pound, the staff of the Department of Social Services is as qualified as any other government agency, and in fact more because a social worker requires a bachelor's degree. The social worker goes into court, it goes into the prison, it goes into the police station, it deals with trafficking, it deals with immigration matters. It goes into the hospital. It goes to the hospital, deal with medical matters. It's, that social worker has to walk in the court and be able to competently defend the department's position and defend the right of the child who's a minor, defend the right of all the persons that they represent because we deal with the vulnerable class. So pound for pound, we are as educated and as trained as every other segment of this country. The problem is people have been um, put into their psyche because they tend to see only the food assistance or the as, um, other programs from community support, that is that is all we do. But we have a very large cadre of very trained officers across the length and breadth of this country. And I think the country underestimates the amount of training it takes to work in this department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's and, both sort of technical skills and what we call the soft skills, right? Indeed. And personal discipline, integrity. I mean, we call this thing uh, uh, emotional intelligence, knowing how to do what you ought to do when you know you ought to do it. And, and with the emotional intelligence is, is managing one's emotions and understanding that, yes, people are coming to me on day worst day times 10, and they still require a professional compassion and from me. Not only that, it has to do with trauma. And trauma across not only the ones in the front and the support, the social worker in the front and the support staff in the back. I myself the other day was taking a call, and the woman became so, tr she was so traumatized on the phone. I had to tell someone, because I'm a clerical of go and call the supervisor because she had to calm this person down because we don't want this person to do something or think in a way that will cost them. Dirt. And she was so, we had to, even the way she was breathing, mm -hmm. we had to calm her down and bring her down. And so all of that is what people don't see. Yeah, yeah. The trauma that we take just from working in that department, from the receptionist on the front desk, when that person walks in, you don't know who's coming in. And, you know, even, even I am remiss because when I, when I was talking about essential workers and when the national honoring uh, ceremony, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention, I don't think I even mentioned social workers with the emphasis and the oomph, of, right, that it's supposed to get. And I think all of us are remiss in that. Um, I got a couple of texts here. The text says, oh, I got a lot here. Erin, I believe these people, these persons were political hires. When a party comes to power, they hire these persons as political payback and to make the unemployment numbers look better than it really is. I don't think these persons should be made permanent because they have no experience. Pay them out and send them home. 
Well, you sent that text at 1040, and I hope between then and now, Texter, you've heard clearly, right, that the levels of experience that they garner on the job and that individuals have taken the time to gain their own merit, their own money, their own training, right? Um, these job program imp programs implemented by successive administrations to make the general citizenry feel like the economy is doing well are killing our economy and destroying persons' lives. The politicians and unions are running this country in the ground. All, in my opinion, evo involves jockeying for power. The politicians hire unskilled workers in the public service for votes, then the unions campaign to have these unskilled temporary workers confirmed for votes. Lord, please help us. Dear Texter, I don't think that's what's happening here. I could be honest with you. Um, and I think you need to delve into the politics of it. Because I don't know who I could be voting for if they have me running up on Briggs for 25 years on $83. Another text. What the PLP did when they was there for social services? I don't, I don't know. I, there's nobody wearing a PLP badge in this room, so I don't know. I, I have no idea. Well, but Aaron, I, I want to say something to the, the, the second text. Yeah. Uh, again, I think they would have brought, um, sent those texts prior to us, well, not prior, but after we would have discussed how educated these individuals are and the training that they pursued to mm -hmm. qualify themselves to be substantive employees. Now, I want to also comment on something that an individual said about the public service being bloated, but I don't think he used the word bloated. Yeah. The public service is not bloated. What is necessary at this particular juncture is that a proper audit of the public service be done and that persons are placed in their proper skill set. And we're going to find that we have some qualified individuals who are being underutilized because they're not properly placed. Right, right. And, and, then, and I, I would say a matter of management that we have tons of skills and we don't know how to properly harness them Indeed. effectively and efficiently, right, um, in, in streamlined ways without major upheaval. But that's a, I think that's about managerial vision and the ability of management to move with the times, right? But then another thing, too, people yeah. are saying on skill level, people tend to stigmatize the public service and tend to think that. However, I myself started on the work program, mm -hmm. and I am not unskilled. I left on Lewis Secondary School with GCEs, with BJCs, and I qualified myself further since then. Let's not allow our um, biases mm -hmm. to color our opinions. Sometimes... Listen to people and separate your personal emotions from the situation. Allow people to be heard. We are just asking here for an opportunity to be heard. I, as an employee, am asking our union to represent us because so much of us have been waiting for a long time to receive promotions. So much of us have been waiting to be regularized. And it seems that there's a desert in, the t in terms of promotion and, and people being... Um, empowered at the Department of Social Services. And because things have been kept down for so long, there's growing tension and anxiety. And the way we address these things is head on. Say what can be done, how we're going to do it, and let's give workers some dignity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm concerned about the morale of these individuals. We talked earlier about the frustration of those persons who social services... Mm -hmm. cater to, but we are failing to recognize the fact that these persons that are expected to be the consummate professionals that they are mm -hmm. have some frustrations of their own, but they cover that up and they cater to the Bahamian public as best as they possibly can. And so being exploited, being frustrated, that you cannot send your child to a school of your choice, being frustrated that you cannot own a home, being frustrated that you cannot go to a bank and get a loan simply because you're considered a temporary individual. All of these are things that dampen the spirits of individuals, but in spite of, they're expected to be professional and to cater and to render services. Let's go to the fact that 
in the midst of any catastrophic situation in this country, while the remainder of us are home trying to get our lives back together again, these individuals has to leave home in the condition it's in and go out there and try to mm -hmm. assist the other persons in society in getting their lives back together because they have some disaster. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really concerned as to how inconsiderate some of us can be. And we're talking real trauma. We're talking about people... I mean, we're talking about real trauma. We're talking about going to homes to deal with children and parents who, whose children have been raped and molested and brutalized, children who've been bullied, right, and, 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 and beaten. And, and I, it's important to understand what people are going through. This is, it's 10.54, I get a series of texts and some calls. So let's go to the calls, and I will say to my callers and my texters, I'm going to ask you to, to practice some spatial awareness, some empathy uh, when you send in, in these texts. Caller, you're on the clock. Hello. Hey, good morning. Morning, how you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. Um, I heard the lady mention, but she's saying that there's some, some unskilled um, persons work. Hello. Uh, you, you, you're still on. Yes, she's saying that there's some unskilled person who is at social services. And I think she, she phrased that way pretty wrong because I have worked for social services for 27 years. Mm -hmm. And I went to college. I still am in college. Mm -hmm. um, they told me that the only way I can get permanent if I go to college, mm -hmm. educate myself, which then I did. Mm -hmm. I went back, I got my um, associate degree, and I'm pursuing my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And 27 years I've been on. And she also mentioned about the PLP. When the PLP was in power, they're the ones that bring me on. Um, I was told that after two years that I would um, get a promotion. Um, and then the FNM came up. And they dismantled all the names that were there mm -hmm. for promotion, regulation, and, and what have you. And I think it's unfair for what he's doing, what Mr. Frankie Campbell is doing to us. I think it's unfair. And there's many more like me. And they're still going to school. They're still educating themselves. And we're not getting anywhere. We're not getting any answer. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. And, and let me just clarify um, as you go. I think it was me uh, that mentioned reading text, mentioned the PLP and the uh, unskilled workers. I was reading the text. Ms. Cawley but is we, actually we, agreeing we have, with you. Ms. Ms. Cawley actually agreed with you and the position that you have, just shared. We, are, we have a lot of social workers who have their masters mm -hmm. and they're still going to school. They're going for their PhD. And, PhD, yeah. and 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 they're, they're 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 making some of them only making four hundred dollars a week. Okay, thank you very much, uh, caller. Thank you very much. We ended on that note because I need to take a breath. I got another caller. Caller, you're on the clock. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. I got uh, I got forty five seconds for you. All right. A commendation to the social worker there. Mm -hmm. Hats off to you all during the pandemic. Thank you for your service. Next, I would like to say three things. Mm -hmm. One is that if you have a career path program, as I am an educator, we have a career path in the Ministry of Education because it brings some form of attachment and it brings some form of accountability between the worker and the employer mm -hmm. where you know the trajectory, how many years, what I need to do to move up, shift, or go to another, you know. Yes, so it brings, it hinges, it's a stapler in the organization. So there's a booklet I can go to and look at and mm -hmm. see if I want to project, do I change, shift, ask for this. Everything is laid out there. And that's a good thing. So I'm asking a question concerning that. The next thing is documentation. You know, if you were hired as a temp, you are a temp, and I think there was a communication between the employer and the employee. You are a temp. If you wish to elevate these other things that you would have to do, this is not a favor program. It's not mm -hmm. a, I hope it's not based on seniority in that instance. 
it's based on your skill and your skill set. If you have done the required documentation to move up, these things will happen and transpire for you. So you just can't expect, I've been a temp for 15 years, so I expect to move. No, it doesn't work like that, and it should not work like that. There's a spirit of excellence and standards laid out in an organization, so I'm asking to that. Then the next and final thing I would like to say is, it was a choice you made. You stayed there for the 45, 30, or whatever years as a temp. You understand? So it still was a choice, even for those persons who are uh, uh, elevating themselves and I'm commending the lady who says she went back for her bachelor's. Excellent. But it's still a choice. Thank and you. I believe it like that. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, I'm going to just read through these texts, and I'm going to give you the last word, knowing that this, is, this conversation is certainly not finished. Uh, one text here quickly. Aaron, sadly, this is happening in all government agencies. People are working like for 20-plus years part-time and no one is doing anything about it. Aaron, the staff at the Department of IT, Information Technology, and the PM's office needs help. The PS is stalling with our raises and promotions. Please help. Uh, another text, I've been a social worker for over 20 years and I have a passion for the work. I'm sad to say that during my tenure, I have seen the Department of Social Services show a genuine lack of care and concern for their hardworking staff. The career path was in the works since I started, and it still hasn't been produced. And now they claim that there is one that was approved, but they have not let us see what's in it. How do we even know that it's in our best interest if they refuse to allow the union president to see it? The work programmers are at a grave disadvantage, and they refuse to send files when requested by DPP? Question mark. We went from working Hurricane Dorian as well as during our regular nine to five jobs to working straight through the pandemic and we have no risk allowance or hazard pay and we are not considered for the allowance offered to other essential workers. What compensation will my family receive if I die from COVID while doing my job? That was a long one, but I'm glad I read it. I am a trainee welfare office. I was headhunted in 2006. HR told me there was a career path which I have never seen despite asking for it. I have a bachelor's degree in social science and an advanced certificate in social work. Every ACR was above average. 15 years later, not once have I been promoted and still have not seen the career path. Oh boy. Another text, political hired or not fool, what is gross, gross is exploitation. These, thank you Texas. I'm not gonna read that one, but we got you. This is unsustainable. Uh, most of these work programmers are essential to the department. These are not people who are sitting down twiddling their thumbs. They care for children's, children and adults in residential homes. They are necessary to the department's overall function. Erin, I agree with the text. It is politics. People are being hired for the wrong reasons. I'm not denying they aren't skilled in some cases. Besides that, I do understand what is being said. Once these workers have been hired, they do deserve to be treated fairly. Lastly, yes, the civil service is bloated, and sadly, productivity isn't what it should be. This needs to be dealt with. Again, like Mr. Ferguson said, it's not necessarily a case of over-bloated. It's a case of poor structuring of placement. and poor placement. In fact, I'm going to invite representatives from the Bahamas Public Service Union on again to talk about a plethora of labor issues. Hopefully next week I can get them on because this isn't the only one. We have to talk about security officers and why security officers are working 12 hour shifts as if that isn't against the labor laws. I think we already know that. Um, I got a story to tell about that. We got some issues, Aaron. Uh, don't we? Another text, you have line staff who have d higher degrees than the bosses. It's sad. Let me give you guys the last word we are almost out. Let me be out of time. Levi's coming on next. Ms. Colley? I just want to thank you for the opportunity and ask people to hold on to and to be encouraged. And I hope that things improve when we have a brighter day at social services. Absolutely. I, I want to say thank you, and I salute the officers over the Department of Social Services. And I want to say to them, together we're going to stand, and divided we're going to fall. I want to say to them, continue to be encouraged and to continue to serve your country with distinction, I want to say that there is indeed light at the end of the tunnel, but we're going to have to collect ourselves, take a stand, and ensure that our voices are heard. Absolutely. And I want to say to you all that if these people are able and willing to come back next week, I'm going to have them on to continue this discussion, because we got to talk about why the people in Abaco ain't had no AC since 2019. This is not making any sense, people. Anyway, it is well past 11 o'clock. That means Unleashed with Levan Miller is up next. 
Have a great day, Bahamas, and stay tuned to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. You use the correct.